This is Monday, September 11, 2006. We are at the Lucky Branch of the Pemberville Public Library. This is Northwest Ohio Narratives. I am Dale Bruning, and Clifford Duncan will be the narrator for today. Thank you. Uh, Cliff, uh, uh, when and where were you born? I was born in Center Township, Bowling Green, Ohio, October the 8th, 1920. Uh, what was your father's name? Joe. And your mother's maiden name, please? Edith Gander. And uh, do you have any brothers or sisters, or did you have any brothers or sisters? One brother. And his name, please? Clark. Uh, where was your father born? Wood County. And your mother? Wood County. In Wood County. Uh, what was your father's occupation? Farmer. Did he do anything else? Well, he was a brick mason for a while, and that's about the only other occupation he had. He worked a couple other jobs, but I mean nothing very extensive or very long. I just. And your mother's occupation? Housewife. She was a housewife. Was, That's uh, right. Was that was normal it. at that time. Yep. Uh, during your early years, do you have any particular family remembrances of Christmas or Thanksgiving or uh, things of this nature that uh, stick out in your mind? <clears throat> I remember one Christmas, we was over to my aunt and uncle's for a Christmas dinner and it snowed and we had just purchased a new Buick automobile. And we were over there for a few hours and had a wonderful meal. And Mom said, we better go home because of the snow. Well, we got within about three quarters of a mile of home, and we got stuck. And Dad got out of the car, and he said, you wait here, because there were some blankets in there for us to keep warm. He went home and got a team of horses, brought them down the road, hooked on the front of that Buick and stuck the lines up through, you know, the split windshields at that time, stuck the lines up through that split windshield and sat in there and drove the horses and we went home that way. <laughs> and uh, where were you living? In, uh, this, uh, Over on Nelson Road. No, where's that at? Center Township. Near Bowling Green? Yes, seven miles from Bowling Green. Uh, since you grew up during the Depression, uh, what... Uh, do you remember this, what was life like during this particular time? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. We sat in a house on a Saturday evening. That's the only evening everyone's shopping. We counted what money we had, or Dad and Mom did, counted what money we had. And then they, we always sold cream. We would take the cream to Bowling Green, sell the cream, and what money they had, they would say, now, we can get one new shirt for Joe. We can get a pair of socks for Clark. Clifford doesn't get anything this week. Then they go down to Red Front Grocery and purchase their groceries. Now, since this was the Depression, did your father have any problems in paying for the farm? Or? No, no. We didn't own a farm at that time. We was very fortunate we was, that we didn't because our neighbors across the road, they lost theirs and had to go refinance it and purchase it back because a commercial bank closed in Bowling Green and that was a catastrophe. Do you remember anything of the CCC or the PWA? Oh, yes, yes. Oh, yes. <clears throat> yeah. Three C's was out there on uh, New York Central Railroad tracks by Napoleon Road in Bowling Green. That's where the camp was. And do you remember what they did? Well, they'd done a lot of work over by Port Clinton, and I don't know what they'd done. I do not know what they'd done. But that's where a lot of their work was done. And uh, let's see, uh, can you tell us where these boys came from? Uh, no, I can't. I don't know. You don't know where they I don't are. know. And uh, where did you go to high school? Pardon? Where did you go to high school? Webster, out of Scotch Ridge. And uh, during high school, what was your favorite subject? Sex. <laughs> If we're talking about baseball, it was baseball. But history was sort of my, yes. History was your favorite subject. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. And uh, in regard to baseball? Uh, well, Myron Long, or Brick Long, was our coach, was a high school baseball coach. And he was very good, very 
cooperative, I should say, and a very good instructor. He told you something once, and it usually sunk in. And th yes, th th there was a, we had a wonderful program there. So you graduated then from uh, Webster uh, uh, 38, 19, in 1938. 19, yes. And uh, you, did you uh, play professional baseball? I <clears throat> played Legion Junior Baseball in 38. Well, I played 36 and 37. In 37, I signed a contract to go play pro ball. I played over at, I was, went to uh, Foster, I'm sorry, Tiffin. That was a, a mud hens farm. And I was there about eight or nine days, and they traded me to uh, Faustoria, which was a, a St. Louis Cardinal farm. And I played there in 38, Middle Atlantic League, uh, down at Portsmouth in 30, excuse me, 39, and played Columbus in 40. And uh, how would you characterize professional baseball then as compared to today? Well, I signed a contract in 1938 for $325 a year and 50 cents a day meal money. And, and when I started out over at Tiffin, we stayed in homes. Maybe two of the players would stay with you, or one player, and that we stayed around in Tiffin, different homes, and help that way to pay our rent. Are you still involved in baseball today? Yes, I am. I I don't get paid or anything for it. I help. Oh, I try to find some good players once in a while, you know, for uh, like the university and things like that. New York Mets and uh, Colorado Rockies. That's where Mike Tribovich, he stopped by Friday, Saturday evening. Mike Tribovich, he works for the Rockies. Whitey Hefner works for uh, Seattle Mariners. And then I had a lot not a lot, yes, quite a bit to do with getting the new field in Toledo, and I feel proud of that. The new Madden Stadium, you, were, yeah. you, had a, you had a part in Cardi that. Cardi and I were on a couple of committees together, and I'll tell you what, you people can all cuss and damn him, but when Cardi told you that he was going to do something, he done it. And that's more than a lot of these people will do. They'll give you a well up, see, I'll see. And, but Cardi, if he decided he was going to do something or have something done, it was done. And do you uh, have you scouted for the uh, Bowling Green University, or do you work for? Oh, the yes, University? yes, I, I look around for that. But you see, Dale, uh, NCAA rules. I cannot come up to you and say, Dale, would you like to go to Bowling Green University for baseball? I can't do that. Mm -hmm. That's against the NCAA rules. I can go to Danny Smith and say, Danny, Dale Bruning out here at Pemberville, I think it's a pretty good prospect. You want to go talk to him? Then he can do it, but I can't. That's because I'm not on the payroll at the university. If I was on the payroll, yes. Uh, can you name uh, any players that you've signed or recommended that have uh, done well? Oh, oh, boy. Mm. The only one I can think of right now is Albright. What about Andy Tracy? Did you? Uh... Yes, I was. I did. Andy, I forgot about him. Yep. Uh, and oh, um, uh, Eloise, the boy that was the pitcher. He's a manager now. Leland. Who? Do you, do you have any relationship with Jim Leland? Well, it was Leland that when he played uh, Legion Junior Ball at Pemberville. And he's now the manager of the Tigers. Tigers, you yes. still have a relationship with him? Yes, yes. And how do you characterize him as a manager? Very good, very good. I think he's a lot better manager than his brother would be. Father Leland. <laughs> <laughs> Hershiser. Hershiser, oh, Hershiser. Oh, Hershiser, yes. Okay. I helped get him into Bowling Green. Yep. Now, leaving uh, baseball, uh, when were you married? Uh, where did you meet Eloise? And, uh... Eloise and I started school in the first grade. We graduated together. And Dale, when I started dating girls, if they didn't like baseball, take them home and get another one. You know, I mean, I just, 
It was just that simple. And now, whether she liked baseball or whether I convinced her to like baseball, I don't know. But anyway, that's the way it went. And uh, apparently, after how many years have you been married now? It'll be 65, the 28th of October. So you were married in 1942. 19... 41, I'm 41. sorry, 41. And you, so you're married 65 years. Yes. And uh, she enjoys baseball. Yes, she does. You are welcome at our house, Dale, as you walked in the other day, and you're welcome as a birds in the May time. But if the Atlanta Falcons are on, Braves, Braves, Braves are on, just come in, sit down, and shut up, because she wants to concentrate on the game. And she will lead you to know that once in a while, that play over there wasn't that good. Now, she's got some adjectives she puts with it that to describe the play and all this and that. So you married in 1941. Now, in the uh, uh, meantime, uh, World War I had uh, broken out in Europe. Uh, you mean two? You know, uh, World War Two. yes. Uh, the German invasion of uh, Poland in uh, hmm. uh, 1939, uh, September the yep. 1st. Uh, were you uh, in the military at this time? Were you in the I National was, Guard? Or? Well, you know, the Legion at Pemberville has an SAL. The National Guard in Bowling Green, Fred Graff was the post commander, and they had something like the SAL that we could go up there with every meeting and we could have instructions and training and do calisthenics and all that stuff. And yes, I, I had that from 38 on. So in 1938, you became a member of the uh, Ohio National Guard? No, I never became a member. You never became a no, member? No, no. So uh, come... Because uh, I was playing ball and that, and their meeting nights, I'd be maybe someplace playing ball, you know. So we come now to December 7, uh, 1941, and that's Pearl Harbor. Yep. Uh, do you remember, and uh, where were you? What was your reaction? My wife and I was feeding Reverend Bunce and his wife. We had a meal for him. And this came over the radio, and Reverend Bunce said, well, what does that mean? And all I said to him was, I'm not going to be here alone. Uh, who's Reverend Bunce? Preacher at Pemberville Lutheran. Okay. That pastor of Bethlehem Lutheran Church. And, mm -hmm. uh, and he was there for Sunday dinner, and you said you're not going to be here That's right. long. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so would you elaborate on that, please? Well, I... Were, in, you, uh, in June, uh, were you already registered uh, the draft? Uh, oh, yes, oh, yes, yes. But in June, I left Wood County, shipped out. Were you, you were drafted? Yes, yes. I was going to enlist, and then I thought, no. I had a fellow tell me, Fred Graff, said, don't enlist. He said, he drafted. He said, then once in a while you can have a little pick, but if you enlist, you have to sign on a paper what you want, whether you want, you know, infantry, artillery, medics, or signal corps, or anything like that. And okay, so you're drafted then in, uh, in uh, 1942, correct? And, yes. Uh, okay, where did you take your physical? I took my physical uh, over here at Camp Perry. Okay, and then when were you, uh, when and where were you inducted? I was inducted over there. In Camp Perry? Yes. And uh, from Camp Perry, where did you go? I went to Camp Edwards, Massachusetts. I went up to Camp Edwards as cadre. And cadre means that you're going up there to form a new outfit. Uh, how, uh, uh, you're going to form a new outfit and you had no uh, training? or had I had, well, I had training through the National Guard. I see. You know, and, and some of this stuff. And so we went up there and formed the 540th Engineers. Now we thought when we formed the 540th Engineers that we was being formed to be a bunch of lovers and they changed their mind. This is combat engineers? <laughs> yeah. 
And uh, where did you take your engineering training? Uh, Up at Camp Edwards. Then we went to... Uh, well, that's an engineering fort then? Or? Yes, yes it is. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, is it we like, took a lot like of amph oh. amphibious training up there. You know, landing craft and all this and that, setting up beach markers and all that. Okay, so you took your uh, training then at Camp Edwards, uh, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. uh, did you get a furlough? No. From Camp Edwards, uh, where were you shipped? We were down to uh, Virginia, Camp Edwards. It was Camp... Uh, Fort Belvoir? No. Eloise. Where you were sent to... Belvoir is a uh, engineering. Yeah, but when I came back from overseas, I went to Belvoir. Okay. So you went from Camp Edwards to Virginia. Oh, uh, Fort. Fort Lee. We, we shipped. We, no, we shipped out of. Um, I'm sorry, Dale. I can't think of it right now. Well, but for, from uh, Virginia, then an engineering camp. Yes. Then, uh, then you were sent. And this is 1942. Yes. Uh, where were you sent then? You were shipped overseas. Yes, but we, I'm trying to think of the name of the camp. We took some more amphibious training, Bedford, okay. and we took engineer uh, and we took amphibious training there. And then we loaded up and we shipped out. So your amphibious training is uh, to be involved uh, with uh, an invasion. Yes, that's right. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, can you uh, you shipped out from what port then? 14th of, of uh, uh, October. From where? Fort Belvoir? No, yes, Fort Belvoir is where we shipped out of. Okay, and uh, where were you sent? Sent to Safi, French Morocco on the invasion. How long did it take you to cross? Uh, well, we shipped out the 14th. We landed the 8th of November. 14th of October? October. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, life on a troop ship? Well, the troop ship we had was the old Dorothy L. Dix. It was a banana boat that used to run between South America and the United States. Oh, it was a charm of a place. It was a charm of a place. Uh, what do you mean by this? <laughs> you slept on the deck and everything else, you know. But we was very fortunate we only had one company, E Company, the company I was in and that was on board that, and we landed at Safi and sent French Morocco. Uh, was there any thought of submarines at the time? Yes, there were. Yes, there were. See, we shipped out and got out someplace in the Atlantic. They wouldn't tell you. And, of course, if they told us, you wouldn't have known anyway. And there was a lot of submarine attacks. We lost quite a few ships. They said at one time there was 800 ships in this convoy. You were in, okay, you were in a convoy of 800 ships. Yes. Okay. And uh, several were lost? Well, some of them, uh, a bunch of us went down to Safi, some went to Casablanca, some went to Port Leone, and some went, we don't know where, but that, none of our business, I guess. So you landed then in? Uh, Safi and French. French, and French Morocco. French Morocco. We had about three days opposition there of the French. Then they capitulated and we took over. And, and how long were you there? About three weeks, something like that. Now, did you have to, uh, in going into Morocco, or you, did you have to invade? Or uh, We had to go in. We was on the, one of the first landing craft that went in, an LCVI, landing craft for infantry. We went in on that. We set up beach markers. There was a red beach, a yellow beach, and a blue beach. And we what, had to set up these markers, and, and that's what, what you different. Mean, what, what do you mean by uh, red, yellow, and blue? Well, if you was in Signal Corps, maybe your instructions was to land at Red Beach. Okay. And if you was in infantry, you was at Blue Beach. And like the engineers and SOS Service of Supply was the land at Yellow Beach. And we set markers up. But first of all, we had to make sure there was no mines or anything like that. And we done that. And then we so part of your um, engineering, you had minesweepers also? Had what? Minesweepers. Yes, you, you, sure had, you had a little minesweeper, mine detector about that big around. 
-hmm. that you carry around like you do a, a, a oh, like metal right detector, here, running the edge of the grass. Uh, metal detectors. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're now in. Uh, North Africa or in Morocco. Yep. From yep. from there, you were there about three weeks, and then what? Then, then we know? started up the coast. We went up towards Casablanca, Port Leone, Marrakesh, all the way up through to Casserine Pass, and up through. <clears throat> yeah. Were you just all? Moving, we did, we you, were, you were moving the Germans out then. Uh, yes, yes, we were moving them back, and. Uh, See, up at Kasserine Pass is where Willa Bushsticker was captured. We wasn't very far apart when he was captured. See, Kasserine Pass is just what it says. It's a pass. And it's narrow in the bottom, maybe a half, three quarters of a mile, maybe a mile in some spots. Well, the Germans backed up down through there and suckered us in, and then they just beat the living hell out of us. We, we lost quite a few. Not so many casualties, but... Uh, deaths, but I mean casualties, you know. Well, so as a combat engineer, where were you in regard to this? Were you in the front? Uh, yes, we were. You were. Yes, we were. You were sweeping the mines. Uh, we were about a half a mile. Yes, we were. And then we was laying our own mines. When they turned around and started pushing, instead of backing up, I mean, talking about the Germans, when they were backing up, then that was fine. We was taking out their mines and getting the junk out of the road. But then when they decided that's enough of this, then we had to lay our own minefields. And that's something you want to do sometime, Dale, lay a minefield. It just, oh, it just took a, See, and the Germans had what they called under their, they would booby trap their mines for the tanks and that with bouncing beddies. What's, what's this, please? Uh, a bouncing betty is a mine. It's about, oh, maybe it carries a pound of... Uh, chemical in it, and it'll jump up about four feet and explode, and whatever's around it is just, it's a human being that blows it apart. Is it full of shrapnel? Yeah, yeah. So you went part way through the pass, and then the Germans uh, yeah. turned around and uh, drove you back, okay. and and, uh, and uh, now is this Rommel? Oh, yes, yes, sir, and Mussolini. See, okay. there was Italian, okay, the Italians, were, here Italians were in there, too. Yep. Okay, so now what happens? Uh, eventually you cleaned, uh, turn around and clean them out? Well, uh, finally, we got them stopped. We brought in a lot more artillery, and we picked up some more planes. There's, planes was none of our business, but I mean there was a lot more planes, and things started to turn around, and then Mussolini, you know, they surrendered, or they gave up and they went back to Italy and so then we had uh, uh, out in the desert we had the desert fox and that and you had Rommel Rommel we, we was out there quite a while okay so eventually uh, Rommel's defeated and uh, and uh, uh, left Africa and so at the end of the African campaign you're in Africa for a while yes uh, where were you stationed there, or what were you doing? Well, we was up at Bizzurti. That's where we were staging, getting ready to go to Sicily. Getting a lot of replacement personnel, new equipment, better equipment. And that's the first time we ever seen LCVPs and all that kind no, of stuff. No, what's that? Yeah. Landing craft vehicle and personnel. And, see, before we had landing craft for infantry and landing craft, you know. And so this is better equipment? Oh, yes, oh, yes. And we had got some LSTs and landing ship tanks. That's the ones with the big doors in front that opens up. You've seen pictures of them. Right. And it was a lot better equipment. Okay, so you're in Bizzurti toward the end of uh, 1942. Yeah, that was the... What's uh, the city of Bizzurti like? Mm-hmm. Pretty well tore up. And that's where Nuzzy had his girlfriend with as always. <coughs> okay, from from <laughs> from Bizzurti, then comes the invasion of uh, Sicily. Sicily, right. Now, from uh, across uh, the Mediterranean, 
what was your method going through in the LSTs and so forth? Yes, that's what we crossed in there. Mm -hmm. And can you give us a little bit of, where'd you meet Ryan? Where'd you meet Patton? In Africa? Or in um, no, Sicily. Sicily. On the beaches of Sicily. Well, let's uh, go from uh, Africa to uh, Sicily now and tell us a little bit about the invasion of Sicily. Well, we uh, see, we had two battalions in the 540th Engineers. First battalion, second battalion. Then we had a headquarters unit. Well, headquarters unit was for paperwork and stuff like that. And the first battalion landed in the Cata. And the uh, second battalion landed at uh, Gila. And uh, we set up markers there, of course. We had set up markers, clear out the, the mines if there was any, and there were some, cleaned the mines out, and got that all set up. And uh, then the other troops started coming in. Of course, the infantry troops was right behind us. They was, they was right with us. I mean, we was the ones that had to clean the minefields out so they could get through. Now this is about in uh, uh, July of uh, 1943. Yeah, I don't remember the exact date we landed there. Yeah, about July 10th yeah. of 43 or something. Mm -hmm. uh, how long did the campaign last? Uh, is, I think this is where you met Rommel, uh, not Rommel, but uh, Patton. Patton. And yes. There was some incident here in regard uh -huh. to him also. This uh, is where we met Patton. Patton came in the same day, about three hours after we got there. and. We had we had got the beachheads all settled down and everything like that, and then about the third day, I think it was the third day, after things had quieted down some, they had a joint meeting between the English and the Americans, and there was a little politics into it, and it was decided that this joint meeting of the officers, the generals, and that that the English were supposed to be in Palermo first. Well, he, that was with Montgomery, wasn't it? Huh? Montgomery and yes, Patton. Yes, yes, yes. That the English were supposed to be in Palermo first. Well, after the joint meeting was over with, Patton called us together, and he told us all about the meeting, and that, and it was about four words he said, four or five. If those goddamn limers are going to be in Palermo before we are, we're, they're going to fight for it. And we took off. We took off. We went around to the right, and the English went around the left, and we was in Palermo about a day and a half ahead of them. Yeah, I remember that. I remember seeing. Uh, yeah. And, yep. uh, and uh, General Patton was there first when Montgomery uh, right. came in, yeah. and the English were quite surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yep. That the Americans were were there. Now this uh, uh, almost ended the campaign then in Sicily. Yes, right? it did. It did. That. Uh, that right. Now, how long were you in Sicily before <sighs> the invasion of Italy? And what did you do? More training. Well, more training. New equipment, because we lost a lot of equip equipment there. See, uh, we had to build a, uh, a road along the right side of the island. Because, because uh, uh, the Germans had blowed the bridge out. And there was a rock side road and rock. So we took an air compressor up there and a guy by the name of Funkhauser was in our outfit with uh, dynamite and cap man down in the mines in Kentucky. And he was our demolition man, and he knew what he was doing. He didn't do it according to the book, but we went up there and drilled holes, and we put about, I think about 2,800 pounds of TNT in some different holes and that, and we set it off, and we had enough rock to, to fill up that gully and get equipment over. That was our job there from then on up through to Palermo, was moving equipment, getting moved up there so they could use it. So, uh, uh, Cliff, we were uh, demolition and blowing rock uh, to fill up a pass so, yes. so, so mm -hmm. that you could get to mm -hmm. Missouri. Now, let's go back for a moment. Uh, you said you met uh, uh, General Patton. Where and under what circumstances? I met him right on the beach at Gila. And uh, personally? At the, 
Gila. She was La Cara and Gila. And uh, that was the only day of the invasion. And we got it solidified enough so that we could have a little room there, a couple, three mile. And uh, the infantry came right in with us, you know, and the artillery was coming in. We had to help move artillery, move ammunition, move gasoline and all that. Now, uh, uh, you talked to him personally? Yes, sir. And uh, under what circumstances, what did he say to you? We were, we were just talking about some of the things that we was going to do, what we wanted to do, and we had a good conversation with him. I wasn't the only one, but there was other ones there, and shook hands with him, and he had his pearl-handled revolver. Well, what rank did you have here? Uh, apparently you were in command of uh, some... Uh, part of the outfit here. The what? What was your rank? And what was your? Uh, I was a sergeant at that time. Uh, every, yeah, and but I was in charge of this uh, uh, platoon, and we were most of our business. Our job was in, uh, demolition, minefields, and stuff like that. We'd build a couple bridges. We'd put in one Bailey bridge, and just stuff like that. It was just. It was really Dale. It was interesting. Ask my wife, I've wanted to put a Bailey Bridge over the river behind our house. What's a Bailey Bridge? It's a bridge that's built out of framing, 10-foot frames, 8-foot high, and each frame will hold 10 ton, and you can put a launching nose on it. The launching nose is, fit, is 10 feet longer than halfway across the river, and you start it on rock and rollers, and you keep shoving it out, keep putting a section on it, keep shoving it out, and when it gets out there, a little past halfway of the river, and a park down and... It was all made, this is made of steel then? Yes, oh yes. And uh, so the um, engineers provided the, the material yes, sir. Uh, to, yes, sir. Uh, to build we the... Had to, we had to transport that, carry that along and everything. Now a little bit about uh, life. Uh, since you did not have barracks, exactly uh, where did you live? Where did you rest? What did you eat? Well... Uh, uh, had a lot of C rations and K rations. That's something that didn't have to be cooked or anything like that. The C rations and that was like out in the desert when we were out there. It would get so hot that the, those cans, you know, how you open sardine cans and that? It would get so hot they'd expand and break that seam and then they'd spoil. So were there a lot of uh, sick uh, soldiers as a result of this? Pardon? Did a lot of men get sick because of the spoiled sea No, so I don't. No, so I'm going to find them. They just throw them away. And you, you had crackers and stuff like that, you know. And, and at Marrakesh in Africa, they had some beautiful grape fruit vineyards. And they had grapes and stuff like that, fruit. So... Once in a while you could steal fruit and stuff like that, you know. No, we didn't steal it, we borrowed it, you know. <laughs> yeah. now, so your sleeping quarters were tents. Uh, how often did you get a shower or anything like this? Uh, not very often. What was a shower back then? Well, well, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, every once in a while, if we was along the ocean, we would just go down there and take a shower and take a bath. Use Fells naps of soap. We had one fellow in our outfit, a darn good soldier, but he wouldn't stay clean. So I detailed three guys to take him down and give him a bath. And they took Fells and Apple soap, an old brush, and they took him down and got some water on him, put sand on his body, and Fells and Apple soap. And when he came back from there, his body looked as red as that red right there. But he was clean. You know what? We never had to worry about him again. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> let's uh, move on from Sicily. Uh, now you're prepared then, and your next invasion is at Salerno. Salerno in, in Italy. In Italy. And uh, again, you're crossing the Straits from uh, uh, Sicily to uh, Salerno. Yes. Uh, what are the conditions? Uh, did you go in? You went in first? It was the first wave. We had to put beach markers up again, Dale. Yes. That was our job. That was our job. 
No, what are the conditions? Because the Germans are occupying uh, Salerno. It, it was a lot, but Sicily wasn't much, I mean, compared to what we ran into in Italy and that. But, uh, see, the Germans were up on high ground, and we were down on the low ground, and they could sort of beat the heck out of us. Now, this is uh, about September 9, 1944. Yes. How long did it take you to secure Salerno? About 10 days. 10 days. 10 days. Lots of casualties? Pardon? Lots of casualties? Yes. Oh, lots of casualties, yes, yes. See, then we made the end of round run. We went to um, the Enzio. That was a rough one. That was a rough one. The Germans had a feeling that they didn't want us in there. And uh, can you give a little more of a description when you say rough? Uh, well, Dale, a lot of landing craft, LCVIs and LCPs and all that, uh, a lot of them were lost there, a lot of boys lost. That is the only place wherever I was that I seen a water run red up along the beach. There's that much human blood. Well, who was the general in charge here? Was this Mark Clark now? Mark Clark, yeah. Mark Did you Clark. meet him? Pardon? Did you meet him also? No, no. No. How long did I you... always figured the way he handled the troops that he wore a skirt. Can <laughs> <laughs> uh, you want to elaborate on that? <laughs> <laughs> no, he didn't. He was an old army term, he didn't have the balls Patton had. And what I mean by that is he didn't have, let's go get him, fellas, and we'd go. And Patton wasn't one of these guys to stand behind. He was in front. And give him credit. Give him credit. That's my wife. I, mm. So, uh, Anzio, it took you how long to secure this uh, then? It took us eight days to secure that beach. And, uh, See, then we had to unload artillery shells and uh, ammunition and all that stuff in there. And how long did it take then before Italy surrendered? Or the Germans surrendered because Mussolini had already uh, surrendered. Yeah, he had. Well, you see, we just left Anzio and then we went up to Naples and that. We just kept on going up to Naples, through Naples, up into Rome. And yeah, do you have any memories of Rome uh, while you were there? Oh, uh, no. No, I don't. I Of Naples, I have a couple pictures. I sh well, you seen the other day. Uh, and then I have one of the, of the, of the tunnel where a lot of the uh, people stayed and lived in Naples. And um, we built the aqueduct to get water back in because the Germans had blowed that out. That was one of our jobs. You, one of your job was to supply water back to the city of Naples for, yes, for the yes. civilian population. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we move from uh, Italy, uh, and then wh where do you go? Well, we went up through Rome, and that's when we were getting ready to go to southern France, and the outfit did, and that's when I had yeah. enough points to come home. Uh, do you remember uh, D-Day? Uh, June 6, 44, the invasion yeah, yeah, of Normandy. Yeah, no. Yes, I, I remember all that, yes. But you, well. were, you would have been uh, going into southern France. But then you, you would have been in, on the invasion of southern France. Yes, correct? I would have been. But I got sent home because on the rotation plan. Okay, so now you come back to the uh, United States. Come back uh, to the United States. Sent me to Fort Belvoir. And they wanted me to be an instructor, which is attack officer there. And I got my commission. And what's your commission, please? Then I went to CBI. Uh, you were commissioned as a? For second lieutenant. No, so this is a field commission then. That's, that, that, right, that, yeah. That's mm -hmm. what they refer to mm -hmm. as a field commission rather than because you had gone to I got overseas and all that. See, I was the first overseas returnee back to Belvoir, mm -hmm. which is an engineer school. And you go back and you study mines, you study, you know, all this and that. And so they wanted you to become an instructor, and yes, uh, you did yes. not uh, care to do this. Mm. And so what was your request? Well, I was there, what, Eloise, 10 days? Boy. Something like that. Well, anyway, the most interesting thing that happened there, Dale, we was having inspection on a Saturday morning of the troops, 
you know, you went through inspection. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, they all fell out there, and this one fellow was a heck of a good soldier. He was very sharp in math and all this and that, but he could not keep his piece clean for Lovner money. So I inspected it, and it was dirty, and I gigged him for it. And you'll know the term when I told him, I said, I called him, and in the, at Belvoir you called them all Mr. Because they all want to become officers. You mm -hmm. call them Mr. I said, Mr. So-and-so, you take your piece and run down to the latrine down there at High Port, and that's up over your head, and see if there's a horse in there. So he did. He took off down there on a double uh, rifle at High Port. When he was in there a little while, I'm pretty sure he came back, high point, went down in front of me and saluted, you know, and I saluted him. He said, sir, I didn't find a horse, but I found one old plug. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the plug that you used to put in the sink? Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, and the farmers used to call a, an old horse a plug. Right. And, yeah, and Judas Priest, that rank just, they went wild. What the hell do you do? You know, you, you just turn and laugh and... So then, then I went to Colonel Bach, who was a commanding officer, and I said, Colonel, I want out of here. And I said, what have you got? Because I couldn't take that shine shoes every day and a tie and all that stuff, you know, and all these guys coming out from Washington, D.C., wanting to inspect and look around. They want, didn't want any information. They just wanted to goof off for a half a day. And he said, got this black unit down in Camp Claiborne, Louisiana, to go to Calcutta, India. And I said, that's for me. And he assigned me four other officers, and I was in charge. We went down and got them. Went to up at Fort Lewis, from Fort Lewis down to Camp Beale, and we shipped out and went to Calcutta. So you were on board a ship with uh, a black transportation oh, unit? Oh, yes, yes, sir. Yeah. How long were you on the Pacific? What's the life like on the ships now? Uh, yeah, that was different. We had regular meals and everything on this one. Oh, you did? Yeah. Of course, I was an officer in that, too, you know, that makes a little difference. I had one fellow, you know, when you're the commanding officer and you're shipping to another post, you're supposed to go through their uh, medical records. And this young fellow, I thought was a pretty good soldier, I still believe he is, or was. And I went through his records, his medical records, and he had three entries on his records of VD. So I called him in, and I said, what in the world is this? I said, three entries on your record of VD. I said, don't you know enough to go buy some protection or something like that? And I don't know what all the conversation. And finally he looked at me and he said, sir, let me tell you. He said, VD and us blacks is about like you whites having a cold. I never will forget that description either. I never forget that. Dale, you know, there's things like that you'll never forget. You know what? Now, we got him to Calcutta, India. We turned him over to SOS, Service of Supply. And they thought that us five officers was a good lord, that we take him to heaven because of all those black girls. Oh, I'll tell you, they was taken to death. They was taken to death. So there were some good parts in them, you know. <laughs> so, okay, so now, now you're in India, you, uh, uh, the, the uh, transportation uh, Yeah, I turned up with the SOS, okay. and I went with BRE, Burma Road Engineers. Okay. And worked on the road, and we done some repair work, we done some transporting, we moved equipment over the road, It went from Kunming, China, Kunming, Quailin, Chikiang, Yunani, and all those towns we went through, and all this and that. So you're building uh, the China-India Burma Road or repairing it, the road's already yeah. built. Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, mm -hmm. you're hauling supplies into uh, Chiang Kai-shek. Yep. And uh, any particular recollections you have of of this? Well, met Clarence Euler. Pardon? Clarence Euler? Yes. From Tagany? Yes. He's with a pack outfit. And we were, the driver I had, we was taking a quick way crane over the road. And I said to the driver, I said, stop this, I know that guy. And so stopped and I jumped off and went over and talked to Clarence a little bit. And 
pack outfit had to keep moving on because that was their job. And he said to me, he said, how are we going to remember this? Well, over along the bank there was a dead Jap. And he'd been there a while. And so we propped him up. And I stood on one side and he stood on the other. On the other. And my driver, I had had a camera and took a picture of us. Yeah. And you can ask Eloise, that Jap looks as if he had a smile on his face. But that's, you know, just some of the things you... Some of the things then, that... Yeah. Uh, yeah then yeah. I got into Kunming, China. I was in there quite a few times. But then one time I went out to the airport and they asked me if I would like to ride along over the hump and drive off supplies. And Dale, that's another experience. You ride those old C-47s with no door over, just a belt across the doorway. And they tell you nowadays you can't fly without compressed, you know, their cabins are compressed and all that. Baloney. We fly over that hump, kick that equipment out, and go on back. And so you flew, you flew the hump also. Oh, yes, surprise. sir. Yes, sir. I, I just got invited to go along if I wanted to go, and sure, I'll go. How long were you in uh, China, Burma, India Theater? For and and uh, one more question uh, in regard to that. Uh, where were you on uh, August 6 and 9, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Where were you at that time? Well, uh, maybe I went too far here. Uh, no, I don't remember for sure where I was. I do know this where I was when the war was over. I was in Kunming, China, in a BOQ, Bachelor Officer's Quarters. When you, you got word that the bomb was dropped? Yeah, and the end of the war. And what was the reaction? Well, we had a BOQ, which is Bachelor Officer's Quarters, and they got beds in there, and you have your rooms and this and that. And all of us carried forty five and some carried Thompson submachine guns and that. And that building had these tile on them for a roof, you know, these half tile. You've seen them. Yes. When we got done, the moon shone in real bright. We shot every damn tile off of that building. But we had it done. We So the war is over and uh, and then how long are you I was there about the third day, and I went down to headquarters, and I said, I'd like to ship out, because I had enough time in. I had my records with me. I had enough time in, and they sent me to uh, Karachi, and I got on a ship, went through the Red Sea, the uh, Suez Canal, and back to the Mediterranean, and back to the United States, back up New York. Prettiest girl in the world. Yes, sir. And so... Uh this brings us then to the uh, end of the war. Yep. Uh, going back uh, for a moment, do you remember uh, VE Day or Victory in Europe? Uh, where were you at the time when the war ended in Europe? You were already in India, is that India, right? yeah, I was in India. Okay. Exactly where, I don't know. And... Uh, you remember, did you know that nurse, Mrs. Denapace, that lives out by Bowling Green, Shavage yes. Road? Mm -hmm. She was in a uh, evac hospital over there. She was in that one that, where that darn elephant went wild and tore up a lot of it. And Any other experiences during, during the war that uh, you might uh, want to relate? Uh, uh. At Anzio, five of us were on a, on a detail. And we got, we was out on a mission, uh, checking on minefields and that, and we got cut off from our outfit. We was cut off for 13 days, and we wore the same clothes and everything like that. One thing about it, we all smelled alike when we... <laughs> well, now, were you behind uh, German lines? Yeah, then? oh yes, we were, yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah. Uh, and only, well, we had some food with us, and you'd pick up some stuff once in a while along as you travel <laughs> through woods and through little towns and this and that. How, how did it happen that you got cut off? Well, we were out to check on this minefield to see that it was still in order, that they hadn't tore it up, to try and stop their uh, tanks from coming in to Anzio. And... Uh, we got a little too far out, and they got between us and our, and the, 
Mackenzie mm -hmm. Owen. So then we had to go and find some place to live and survive. And how did you get back without being Just caught? Uh, going around, we stood pretty close to the water, so we could see water most of the time or hear water, and we moved a lot at night. We moved a lot at night. And, you know, they are, uh, those tanks, you can get down to the ground and put your ear on the ground, and I could tell you by the sound whether that was a German tank or an American tank, by the sound it made on the ground. Because they, they, they rattle that ground, that ground rattles. Whatever term you want to use, that's not the correct term. But I, I could tell you how that... Yeah. Well, what's, the, what's the difference? <clears throat> well, I think it's the way the tracks are built on them. The American tank has a, a lot narrower from the front of the track to the back of the track. I think I was about eight inches and yours is 12 or 14 or something. So they made, the German would make a lot more noise. Yes, yes, it would. Yep. No, any That's other... just like a uh, tank, those two tanks, it's just like your mother-in-law tiptoeing in to check on what you're doing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> any other uh, recollections no. of... Uh, the no, war. I, uh, no, I I got a uh, a lot of buddies over there, and no. how many of your friends were uh, uh, didn't come back? Oh. You know. I would imagine quite a few. Being in the, being in the engineers, you were in the yeah, a great we, deal of danger. Mm -hmm. well, out of the two hundred E Company. What was it, Eloise? 135 come back? Not very many, I know. Yeah. A lot of them were injured in that. And so, maybe this is not a very good question. Do you become a little bit uh, immune or hardened to death, to seeing someone? Very much so. Uh, Ask that lady over there. Uh, Somebody. I shouldn't say it, but somebody dying is, that's the way it's supposed to be. And This is the way you almost have to feel when you're in the you're military. Right, you're uh, right. that, uh, yes, yes, it, it is. It, it just yes, it is. You can lose one five minutes from now over there at 100 feet, but that's just, that's just what happens. It's just what happens. And uh, in regard to the German casualties, you, I'm sure you saw a lot of uh, dead Germans, and you were talking about the Japanese, and uh, any emotional feeling there, or? I was glad to see every one of them there. So let's uh, move on here uh, for a moment. Uh, you're now, wh where are you discharged? Where? Where and when? What year was that, Eloise? When you were in for a long time before you actually were discharged. Yeah, I think I was discharged in 52. Well, where, See, where? I stayed in the reserves. Oh, you, okay. So you, the end of the war and then you stay in, you reserves, in, the, in yeah. the reserves mm -hmm. uh, as a um, what, second lieutenant? First lieutenant. First lieutenant. Okay, so now uh, you come home, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I'm going to backtrack. You were married, uh, say, 1941, and before you went into the Army, what was your occupation? I worked for John Hagemeyer as a carpenter. Okay, and you come back uh, after the war, and then? We moved out there on a farm, started farming. And you were a farmer? for a, a period of time. Yes. And uh, you also started a manufacturing? Well, I worked for a different, couple of different companies. I worked for a lifetime there in, Bowl in Pemberville, and then I worked for um, Bill Goodman up in Detroit, and then I decided I was going to have my own business. And Bill Goodman's a Jewish fellow that helped me out very much, very much. So now you're back in uh, in Pemberville and you're still involved, or you become involved very much in the uh, American Legion. Yes. Uh, 
prior to 1940, when did you join the Legion? Probably about 45 or 46? I think 46. 46. I believe. And uh, you became very deeply involved in, in the Legion. Yeah. And uh, particularly in uh, the building of a memorial for mm -hmm. not only World War II veterans, but uh, veterans of all wars. Uh, can you give us a little bit of uh, history on that? Um, if you remember, where did, where did the Legion meet? To the, the American Legion was formed, as I recall, about 1919. Yes. And uh, where did that, uh, it had no permanent... They met most of the time up over Beaker's store. I remember that my first meeting was up over Beaker's store. Okay, and then you had the fire at uh, uh, mm -hmm. Hobart Ballas. Yes. And uh, so in that the smoke uh, affected the Legion Hall above Beaker's store. Mm -hmm. And so the Legion meets then where? Oh, Dale, we was all over. We was all over. We met a couple times down in uh, Minnie Wolf's garage and all that, you know, down by the bank and all that. So uh, you're now involved in the project of uh, building a uh, Legion Hall for uh, World War II veterans. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, what are the problems uh, involved in, in this project? And what part did you play? Well, I was post commander for a while when it was being built. I was the one, I guess, that Otto Peters drew up the specs and everything like that. And Cap Miller helped very much. Roy Spicer did. Uh, Dutch Rody was fellows that helped with it. And we just, we just sort of knit it together and got it done. The, the present uh, Legion Hall, and that, uh, the, he, the land was uh, purchased sometime in 1945. Yeah, from Schlees. From Schlees, yeah. uh, and uh, the buildings were moved, and then uh, uh, there was an attempt, as I recall, to uh, pass a bond issue to build the building, mm -hmm. and this was defeated, and so how, where did the material and uh, all of this come from to build the uh, present Legion Hall, and what part did you play in this? Well... When we found out that the levy didn't pass, the bond issue didn't pass for it, we said, well, we're going to do it one way or another. And we started in. We had a lot of volunteers. Uh, the Woodville uh, Lime furnished the box, five cents a piece. The only thing we had to do was we had to, they wanted us to buy their cement and screenings and that from them, and we did. And we just had a lot of people that weren't even in the Legion or uh, that helped us. The Martins and all those, geez, they helped. I was trying to think who dug the trenches to put the foundation in. I know Otto Peters is the one that specified how wide the footer should be and all this and that and how deep and all this. And you were, uh, during this time, you were uh, the commander of the um, uh, Legion during the yes. time that it was built. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, one other, um, I think, that, uh, that's important, uh, during World War II, some ten boys or men from Pemberville were, mm -hmm. uh, gave their life for our country. Uh, did you organize anything to see that they were appropriate burial arrangements for these because they were brought back from... No, uh, I, we didn't arrange anything. We arranged getting the bodies back here and to the the location that the next of kin wanted. That was that was our job. Mm -hmm. And if they wanted uh, uh, Paul Bears, we furnished them. If they wanted color guard, we furnished that. But that was strictly up to the next of kin. Now, did you organize the color guard and the, uh, the firing squad? Is that uh, yes, we did. Uh, did you do this? Uh, were you part of this? Well, Charlie Opel done part of it. Uh, Donnie Bonson done part of it, and myself. Uh, we got. 
and uh, so th this was really the beginning of the firing squad and the uh, yes. and mm -hmm. the uh, color guard that the uh, Freedom Post now has. Mm -hmm. uh, in regard to the American Legion, um, what great service does it provide uh, to the country and to the Pemberville community? Well, Pemberville Legion has a Legion baseball team. They have a calf club, and they have a hall there that you can rent or you can use, and for different community actions and and that so they've provided a great service uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, positive service mm -hmm. to, to Pemberville and the entire community uh, if you remember Tom broke already book uh, the greatest uh, generation um, do you have any comments on that and why we might feel that uh, your our uh, generation uh, certainly one of the greatest. Uh, uh, do you have any comments on that? No, I don't. No, I don't. Do you agree with him? Uh, well, I, I didn't read it all. And I just borrowed it from a person one time and read part of it, and I didn't finish it. And, you know, every generation's good deal, but some's better than others, you know what? And we was pretty good. We we're pretty good. Uh, do you have any, uh, from all of your experiences of, uh, in your 85 plus years of advice you would give to young people, uh, to our country? Uh, Don't give up on sex and watch your Viagra. <laughs> With that... <laughs> With that, I think we shall uh, conclude the interview. Valerie's <laughs> <laughs> face is red. <laughs>